So um, starting up, I just want to welcome everybody because I kind of did that at a CAF conference this morning. Um, and thanking Carrie for organizing this amazing orientation that you guys have all um, enjoyed for the last week and a half. We have a week and a half or so more, at least. Almost um, two. Yeah, okay. basically two more weeks. Great. So, so what Carrie has asked me to talk about today is perf is microbial perfusion imaging. And I know some of you probably did you got you guys did you guys do stress tests mm -hmm. in your prior jobs? So did you do any of the image? Did you stick around to read any of the images out with them? Not really. No. Okay. So this. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about, I'm not going to talk about how to do stress tests as much, but it will be on kind of an overview of the kinds of imaging that we do frequently here and what the images look like and how you order. I don't know how you order them. So that we won't go into. But we, Carrie, I'm sure, can teach you how to order these tests um, online. Um, so I'll talk to you a little bit about the patient prep. Um, you know, who to call if you have questions, and again, the common kinds of tests that we order. And please feel free, stop me if something doesn't make sense. So um, talking just briefly about coronary physiology, um, talking about the three main myocardial imaging studies that we do here are um, stress tests, and we use both SPECT and PET. And SPECT is really common, used in a lot of centers, um, used in the community. PET is less so. Um, most places have PET ca cameras, but they do mostly um, FDG, uh, which is a radioactive tracer, um, cancer imaging with it. But we, we um, have the ability to do cardiac imaging with it. Um, and then viability scans, and again, we can do those using both SPECT and PET technology. I'll talk about more about that with you guys all and the group on Friday. And then inflammation imaging. Yes, Carrie. Respect. Stand for Go. We'll get to that. <laughs> um, and so uh, it, those are two different kinds. It, it, it all has to do with the kind of radio tracer that you inject and the camera that you image it on. So you'll, you'll see those. I'll have pictures of it all. So it's kind of starting out, you guys, with just basics of coronary physiology. And this is work done by a guy named Lance Gould um, in the 70s here at the Seattle VA. And as many of you know, if you've lived in this community for a while, that a lot of, um, a lot of pretty large advances in cardiovascular, both in imaging as well as the treatment of cardiovascular disease, actually took place in Seattle. Um, and this is one of them. So Lance Gould is probably, I think most people would agree that he's probably the world expert in coronary physiology. And he trained here, he trained here with Jim Caldwell and Jim Ritchie um, at the Seattle VA and, and worked here for quite a while. He's now at Texas Heart. And he did this study in the 70s on dogs. And he looked at, on this axis, it is the blood, the amount of blood flow down a coronary artery. And this is in cc's per kilo, or cc's per minute per gram of tissue. And in the normal resting state, so us all just sitting here, um, we have about one, c one cc per um, minute per gram of myocardium of blood flow that's going down the coronary artery. Now, when if the fire alarm went off and the building started to shake and we started to run outside, our heart rates go up, blood pressure goes up, coronaries dilate because you need to increase your cardiac output. So coronary arteries have the ability to dilate, increase flow down them, um, and in response to stress. And so um, we do this either by running somebody on a treadmill or by giving them something that dilates coronary arteries. So, um, and what he showed was that even in an 80, 85% narrow stenotic blood vessel, so this is percent luminal di diameter, so stenosis, even in an 80 or 85% stenotic vessel, you maintain the ability to get in the resting state a reasonable one or slightly under one cc of um, uh, per minute per gram of tissue. And, and so that's why, obviously, patients with bad coronary disease don't have chest pain at rest. They have chest pain or they have symptoms when, um, when they're unable to dilate the coronary artery. So what he showed is, is at about 60 or 70 percent st percent stenosis, and this is the standard deviation, it, it's pretty wide. 
um, that's when you start noticing that the artery can't dilate adequately. So that's where this whole idea of a 70% lesion is something we should treat. That's sort of where this came from, is Lance Gould and a bunch of dogs in the Seattle VA. It's to say that a 70% stenosis is considered a functional stenosis. Now, that's kind of gone out the window, and we'll talk a little bit about what that is. So the whole idea of stress perfusion imaging is we take, we inject a radio tracer that just follows blood flow at rest, and we get a pattern of blood flow. And then we do something that attempts to increase blood flow down normal vessels. And we then can note when an artery is you know, about 70% narrowed or not because it can't dilate adequately, and we'll talk more about that. This has been repeated in humans. He actually repeated it in, the, in 1984. He did a bunch of um, coronary flow reserve measuring flow in patients who are undergoing open heart surgery in the OR. So this has been repeated in humans. So the whole foundation of stress perfusion imaging is patient comes in at rest, and um, this is considered sort of, think of this as the left ventricle. This is the myocardium. Um, of the left ventricle. And what we do is, the, and these are my fake coronary arteries that I cartooned in. Um, so we inject a radio tracer that gloms onto blood flow and follows coronary arteries. And even in the setting of a pretty significant stenosis, we inject that tracer and it uniformly is delivered throughout the myocardium. Because again, resting flow is maintained even in a pretty stenotic vessel. Then we do something to dilate coronary arteries. And so you can see these vessels are bigger. Either we've run them on a treadmill or we've given them a drug. Um, we used to give dipritamol, then we went to adenosine, and now, we're considered, now we do regadenosine. Those things dilate coronary arteries and to create heterogeneity of coronary blood flow. So regions that are fed by healthy arteries dilate. More tracer gets to that region of the myocardium compared to a region of the myocardium that's fed up by a diseased or hardened vessel, can't dilate as much, some tracer gets there, but proportionally a lot less. So these are, what, these are the images that we get. So we essentially look at stress, the pattern of blood flow at stress, and see if that matches the pattern of blood flow at stress. And if it doesn't, regions of reduced uptake that improve at rest, we say, I think that region is fed by a diseased or hardened blood vessel. That's the kind of whole pre premise behind stress perfusion imaging. Does that make sense? Is this stuff you guys know? Because if it is, we can just skip it through. I mean, I, I, we would send our patients to go get stressed, uh -huh. but uh, working as a nurse on the floor, we never really, yeah. right? we would read reports, but we never really Never really read. saw what it looked like, yeah. And I remember as a nurse, this will date me, but I remember as a nurse, sending people off for dipritamol or persantine thalliums. And I used to think, wait, how does dipritamol stress anything? Because it doesn't. It's just a di blood vessel dilator. <laughs> so really, I remember when we used to give persantine to people who were having MIs for unstable angina because it also has antiplatelet effects. So, um, but we don't even get persantine anymore. And so we do this because stenosis, we can't, I mean, there's been all sorts of studies looking at exercise duration and percent stenosis. And as you can see, there's no correlation. There are some people with terrible coronary disease that for some reason can still exercise a long, long time. And there are some people with no coronary disease who can't exercise hardly at all. So we need something else. And we also know that, you know, a lot of patients will say, well, I just had a calf. Why do I need a, a, a vasodilator stress test? Or why do I need a, a physiologic study too? And that's because you can't necessarily look at a percent stenosis and know the amount that that artery can dilate. There are still, so FFR and, um, and uh, percent stenosis don't correlate nicely. But what we do know is that physiology, or the ability of an artery to dilate, um, does predict outcome. And so this is um, a, uh, a sub-study of the FAME trial, where they took patients that were going to the cath lab with an anticipated need for a PCI, and they were either, once they saw a lesion, they were randomized to either the operator thought that it was a greater than 50% stenosis and sort of saying visually, it looks like it needs to be treated versus doing an FFR to help further guide. And what we found here is that patients who had an FFR guided PCI did better long term than people who just had a visual, a visual interpretation. So what we know is, you can't just look at anatomy anymore. You've got to look at physiology. 
So the kinds of ways that we can alter blood flow is we can treadmill people. We can give them, and this is, it's not so new anymore, it's kind of newish, I say. Um, and what these um, drugs do is just dilate coronary arteries and try to create heterogeneity of blood flow. And rarely we do a dobutamine anymore. Um, we used to do more of them in people who couldn't exercise, which is a lot of the patients in our hospital, um, and who couldn't get a vasodilator. And the older vasodilators, people with bad reactive airway disease, we didn't give. Um, now, regadenosin is pretty safe to give people. Do you guys gave it to people? Mostly give regadenosin. Yeah. But I do have a question. Do you guys, um, what is your take on giving regadenosin to patients who have a history of seizures? There's that one like case report thing that came out. And yeah, people have kind of a black boxy thing. It is considered a contraindication. Okay. Yeah. Although I don't know that I, I mean I, I'm sure I've given it to somebody with a seizure disorder, but I don't necessarily rem remember that being an issue. So no, yeah. we don't really discriminate whether or not to give it based on that. Mm. There's really not a lot of things that prevent me from giving uh, regadenosin. Um, Except maybe, I mean, obviously, if they haven't had caf if they've had caffeine in the last 12 hours, mm -hmm. I'm not going to give it. Um, but it's, I think it's pretty safe, and it's very well tolerated. Um, we did an adenosine yesterday for the first time in probably five years, and I just forget how terrible that is for patients. So it's regadenosin, adenosine without the yeah, without this is with it's a more selective. Panic and pending doom. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> when, so about 17 years ago, um, uh, they hired me to start doing the stress test down here, and we were giving persantine back then. It, it took forever, and you used to get to reverse it with aminophilin. Did you guys? Use it wasn't that long ago. That <laughs> you guys switched. Well, well at we prof. still at prof because of the expense of Lexi. Uh, we oh, yeah. still if, until about. A few months ago, we were supposed to use presenting oh, unless we God. had, <laughs> unless we could justify like severe asthma. Um, it just took forever. They they just are much yeah. longer tests. So, we went to a dentist in a long time ago because. If people feel bad with persantine, which some of them do, you have to reverse it with aminophilin. And we have so many patients with terrible EFs and histories of VT and VF. And I was always nervous that you know they were going to VF when I gave them aminophilin to get rid of the headache that they got with persantine. So we went to a dentist in a long time ago. That said, the first couple I did, I was like, this is just terrible. I mean, you know, they all think they're dying, and it's six minutes and goes on for six minutes and it's terrible and I remember coming out and telling Jim Caldwell the guy who hired me to do this I can't do this I mean like every day like they think they're gonna die <laughs> yeah he's like Lori it's your job to show them they're not <laughs> so, the, so they all they just felt terrible and so to answer your question Lexus scanner or regadenosin is made by the same people who make a denison and they undercut themselves so that it's less expensive it's about um, it's about $40 less expensive a dose than a denison to really encourage people to use it. And it's really easy. Um, you know, there's just a single injection, none of this drawing up, pumps. And most patients do okay with it. You know, they don't they don't have that impending doom feeling. It's more do, cardiac selective. Do they have the tachycardia? And they get, a, some people, there's oh, really no, no relationship between, I think I've got a slide on this, well, um, there's really no relationship between hemodynamic response and, and coronary vasodilatation. So some people do get a little bit hypotensive and, and somewhat tachycardic. It's really variable. It's not dramatic. But people who get it, got adenosine didn't really have, I mean, they all got more hypotensive and some got a little bit of tachycardia associated with it. So it's not like the adenosine, you know, that you give upstairs. We're giving like 60 milligrams over five minutes and an average 70 kilo person. So SPEC, Carrie, is called, it's a photon. Essentially, SPEC stands for Single Photon Emission Commuted Tomography. So it's essentially a fancy name for imaging a photon. <laughs> and photon emitting tracers are really gamma emitting tracers. So gamma is, is the most common photon. These are the three gamma emitting tracers that emit, um, you know, are, uh, are uh, photons. 
and that is thallium, cestamibi, and tetraphosmin. And so thallium was the first tracer, and so that's why still people say, you know, I want to stress thallium. Well, we stopped doing stressed thalliums here in 1994, um, but, you know, you guys will work with Dan Fishbein. He'll still say, you know, do a stress thallium. Like, we don't do those. You know, we <laughs> we stop giving thallium to people. As you know, they just people forget, and there'll still people who will write. You know, you will work with attendings. Well, some of our older ones aren't going to CC, do the CCU, but they'll say do a persantine thallium, and you know we don't do any of those things anymore. Um, but when thallium was the only tracer, it was a really good tracer, um, and so it's a potassium analog, and we still use it for uh, viability studies, and we'll talk about those. The two. Um, the two are newer generation um, studies, are tracers, are sestamibi, and again, people will say, Dan will say, we'll do a stress mibi. <laughs> we ne we've never used mibi here, and he's only practiced here, so I don't know why he says that. <laughs> he must read the literature and it talks about sestamibi. Um, these are essentially comparable tracers, and we just have a contract with Cardinal and we get the tetraphosmin. Um, we've never used mibi. Um, but you'll still hear people <laughs> say, you guys use Mibi, yeah. Well, maybe he has a secret life, but he's, he's hilarious for saying that. Do a stress Mibi. So we don't use <laughs> Mibi. Um, we use Tetraphosmin, and these are just generic blood flow tracers. Um, and we, in people who are normal body habitus, and we define that pretty loosely at men under 240 or 250, women under about 200, um, we can accomplish this all in one day by giving them a low dose of the tracer at, for the resting images, and then take a set of pictures, and then do the stress study or create heterogeneity of blood flow, inject three full dose, higher dose of, this, of the agent. Um, and so essentially you're comparing a low dose of tracer at rest to a high dose. For really big people, um, it's a two-day test. And so again, we do same dose, high dose on two different days. The half-life of these of the, uh, the tetraphosmin labeled tracer, technetium-99 label tracers, is about three hours. Um, and so you know, within a day, it's the other doses are kind of gone. Um, you guys will order a reasonable, I mean, the CCU right now orders a, a reasonable amount of stress uh, uh, of these studies. Mm -hmm. So do these tracers just have an affinity for the coronary anatomy? No, great question. There are generic blood flow tracers. So that's why there's a slide in here that says they do have to be NPO for six hours. And, and people, you know, there's a lot of things. We keep people NPO for in the hospital for six hours. And when we say they have to be NPO, well, it, and the only reason is that if they decide to try to die during it, you know, they vomit and then they could aspirate. So this is one of those tests, though, that if they're not NPO and they've just eaten a big meal, all the tracer goes to their gut. You lay them down, their gut comes up, and they, it just shadows the whole inferior aspect of their myocardium. So you get less good pictures. So the NPO status in these people is because of the tracers, not because something if something bad happens, we, you know, because there's a lot, they say for stress echoes, they need to be NPO. Well, there's really no, um, there's no physiologic reason for that. It's just that in case something happens, you know, they have the big one when you're stressing them. Yeah, they have the big one. But our test, it really does matter. For any of these perfusion imaging, the NPO status is really imperative. So these tests take about three hours. You know, you give a low dose, you wait, you take a set of pictures, you stress them, you wait, and you wait because these tracers sort of have to clear out of the bowel or they clear out of the bowel and the liver more rapidly than they do out of the myocardium. Do you feed them after? We don't, some people do though. Um, that is the one difference. Mibi, the, if you get out the package insert of Mibi, it says to feed them. My view, it doesn't. And nobody can really reconcile why that is. So we typically don't. If we take the first set of images, Catherine, and they're just awful, we will give them a little something to eat. Um, and sometimes it helps and sometimes it makes it worse. Did you guys feed them? Definitely. And it made yeah. the images were so much better after they'd eaten. And See, we go back and forth. But because the tetraphosma people say no, the chief has always been kind of against it. There's, a whole, there's another little study that we reviewed last spring that looked at 
give them seltzer water or carbonated water and that after and that that helps sort of move the bowel away but no we, we don't typically that. That. did you guys try that yeah and they went back to feeding feeding mm -hmm. so the whole takes it takes about three hours and then um this we'll skip this for um brevity of time so um so we do probably 70% of our stress work here is in using SPECT, and about 30% is PET. We do about six to eight rest stress PETs a week. And um, PET stands for a positron, so rather than a photon, this is a positron emitting um, tomography, or com computed tomography. This is what the PET camera looks like. Um, the bore here is, um, is about 38 inches, so if somebody's really big, they don't fit in it. But overall, and the va we have one pet camera here. The vast majority of the time, it's used to do um, cancer imaging. But we do have, like I said, do a reasonable amount of pet imaging. So the, um, the pet tracer that we use is Rubidium. Um, we <clears throat> used to use N13. And the, one of the reasons why cardiac pet imaging, so these are, again, blood flow imaging tracers. Um, is rubidium you need a cyclotron on site to make so there's not a lot of places that have a cyclotron now the University of Washington does have a cyclotron we have a big cyclotron in the basement here we have a huge radiochemistry department and they make in fact um, they make radio tracers for all sorts of different types of studies um, and so they used to make us ammonia for about a decade they made us ammonia um, the problem with that is that it um, they could only make us so many doses on so many days of the week, and um, it really didn't it, it didn't meet the demands of the st the studies. So we then the only commercially available um, pet tracer is rubidium, and rubidium is um, so cycle. You need a cyclotron to make this, and really what they used to do is make it in this cyclotron, and we would pick it up in this little you know, pig thing, um, and run it upstairs, and it was like a well-timed NASA kind of thing, and we'd have to be ready to inject as soon as, in, and because um, the half-life of these tracers, look at the half-life of the tra of N13 is, is like 10 minutes, but look at the half-life of this tracer. This is 90 seconds radio tracer. So, rubidium is commercially available, and the way it's commercially available is you buy a strontium generator that gives off rubidium and we have one delivered here um, once a month cost thirty thousand dollars so you have to have a reasonable business to make this a profitable venture um, and that's why the private private groups you know just aren't gonna do this because you have to do a good number of, of these scans um, but the half-life is crazy short um, and so We'll talk about some of the very good parts about why we do PET imaging. So patients, again, in the bore, the um, strontium uh, generator is hooked to them. You deliver a resting dose, take eight minutes of pictures. You give them a vasodilator. You inject a second rubidium dose, take eight minutes of pictures. And patient walks out 20 minutes later. So the whole test is done in 20 minutes. And it's really pretty images. So that this is what you guys are going to do the most ordering of, is PET. Um, rest stress PET scans and that's because um, of a couple things that PET offers that SPEC does not. The first is that um, inherent in this PET scanner is a, is a low dose CT so that before the rest images and before the stress images they do a low, low dose CT and then using mathematical this mathematical modeling it will take the PET images and be able to subtract it knows between the heart and the camera head, at this angle, the kinds of tissue that that um, positron had to go through, and it mathematically calculates, subtracts it out. So it says it went through this thick of a, a sternum, this much breast, this much lung, and it makes mathematical corrections for that. So you get really, really pretty images, even in really big people, in minutes. Um, the second thing is I'll show you, and this is not commercially available everywhere, and in fact, um, but we can, we can quantify coronary blood flow. So going back to that Gould plot, 
the, the idea of spec, it's a pattern to a pattern. It's not precise. You miss balance three vessel disease. You miss small vessel disease. Um, but PET allows us to draw a region of interest and say how much tracer got there at rest and how much tracer got there when all the arteries should have dilated two to three fold. So we can actually pick up patients, a lot of the patients that will be on you guys as service will people with, we know, diffuse coronary artery disease, disease in every vessel. And we want to know what's the worst. Um, you'll take care of post-heart transplant patients who you know has, you know, post-transplant vasculopathy, who you're going to completely miss with PET or SPECT. So we are able to quantify blood flow and what that looks like. It's not so much probably for a lot of patients under you guys' service, but the radiation dose is just extremely low. I'll compare it for you, and we can do it all in 20 minutes. So it's really, and because we have this strontium generator always right here, you guys can call and say, hey, we got this patient upstairs, they need a rest dress pet, and likely we can fit it on because it takes 20 minutes and we can just put them on between cancer patients um, at any point. So again, they need to be NPO, and we can't hook it to a treadmill. Um, many of your people are going to be treadmilling kind of candidates. Card B patients might, but um, it, it's only vasodilator because of the half-life of these tracers, you actually have to be in the tomograph when we do whatever we're going to do because you don't, in that minute and a half, you don't have time to inject, get them off the treadmill in the PET scanner. So, go ahead. Um, so is this generator used for all the PET studies? No, just cardiac imaging. It's just a blood flow tracer. So just cardiac. So that $30,000 expense, you guys do enough of these per month to make that? We oh. do. They are expensive though. So a, an average spec scan um, here is about $6,000. So most, most, and nobody, of course nobody pays that, but that's what's charged, is for rest stress spec, is about $6,000. For a rest stress pet, it's about nine. So it's, it is considerably more expensive. It's gotten less over the last year and a half because we do more, and so they actualize the money over a larger, they readjust the rates once a year. So is that the only reason then cost why more people don't order yeah. the pets? Absolutely. Okay. Because it is, let me tell you, I would want one. If I yeah. was, if I needed a rest stress vasodilator study, I would much prefer to have a 20 minute test with a third of the radiation. Um, yeah, so it is just that the volume. It's more accurate. It's it's definitely higher. more accurate. It's more, it's, it's been shown in studies to be small studies, to be more sensitive, to be more um, specific. Mm -hmm. It's a much better, but because it's not widely available, people mm -hmm. just sort of go, oh well, you know, so a lot of the insurers, Medicare will pay for it, and most insurances will pay for it in patients with established coronary disease or heart failure. Um, Medicaid won't ever pay for it. So the only patients, and you guys, most of your, your inpatients, it doesn't matter what kind of insurance they have, will do anything on an inpatient except a Medicaid patient because Medicaid won't pay for cardiac pet under any, any um, uh, conditions at all. Mm -hmm. um, oh crap, I lost my question. Pet. Yeah. Um, I okay, we'll come back. Yeah. So look at the radiation doses. So when we really... Oh, that's what I was going to ask oh. you about the millisieverts. Okay, here we go, millisieverts. Okay. Average Seattle light. <clears throat> Those of you that have recently moved to Seattle, I think it's a little higher than maybe where, where you were previously. <laughs> but and it's certainly this summer without the cloud cover or with. Um, but three millisieverts is what your average Seattle resident gets every year. Um, stress fat. So for decades, the reason why stress perfusion imaging came into its heyday in the 90s and 2000 is because. Um, once thallium was, wasn't the only thing, and we actually had technetium added, we did what was called dual isotope studies forever and ever, where we gave people thallium at rest and then immediately stressed them giving them tech. But look at the radiation doses associated. I mean, we did this, this is when people were having two or three a year, lots, lots of radiation. Like this is what, uh, this is what a pretty good whole body's chest, abdomen, and pelvis CT is. 
it's a lot. Um, this is what your average sort of, uh, I'm sorry, this is a low high, and this is a two day, this should be a high high, so this is a two day. But, so your average low high, maybe that you guys were doing, is about 13 millisieverts, um, which isn't too bad, but look what a low to, look at what a pet is. It's six, so it's just, it's in the big picture of life, I think it will ultimately replace SPECT. And how much do you get when you go on an airplane? That I don't know. Okay, so we'll just go over some cases. Um, so you guys, these are the things that a study will tell you. LV size, LV function, is there ischemia, extent, location, severity, infarct, extent, and location, and if, of course, they did a... Um, so rest images, stress images, and um, so let me say, I'm downstairs every day and if you and most of the attendings will still call me and say Lori this is the scenario what do you think is the best test for this person so f please just call downstairs um, ask for me page me um, I have a fellow or two down here all the time but it, very commonly people will call and go you know so this is the scenario this is the question I want answered what's the best test to have done so feel free just to call at any point um, and also you're welcome to come down and look at the images and a lot of the teams do how much is it much much less so somebody that's like a flight attendant gets two point something I see no, I'm so you. sorry you two that moved to Seattle <laughs> I'm starting to regret no, no, that's, that's your <laughs> no, that's just oh that's in here oh that's just her flight no per Per flight is 2.38 micro sieverts oh. to the negative part. <laughs> um, but so Carrie, this brings up your point. So come down and look at the images. Also, we always put the images, a screen capture of the images in packs, so you can look at them in packs if you want. Um, but always just, you know, if you order a test and, and then there's a result, um, I try to run upstairs if I know somebody that, you know, I know ordered it and I'll show it to you but feel free to come down and look at it on a screen it's even better but Carrie this makes your point of look at all the trace all these bright areas are the tracers that's the tracer so you can see it just follows blood flow which makes for fun because I'm a cardiology nurse practitioner but I've had to, like we've picked up breast cancers and lung cancers and lymphomas because these tracers will go to other areas that we don't expect. That so are vascular. That are vascular. So do you run the camera more than just over their chest? No, just this. Just, just that. Just that. Wow. So we picked, but we picked up a ton of stuff. We picked up a, a, a thoracic kidney a number of years ago. A woman who had a kidney, her right kidney was in her left, her right chest. Hmm. I know. Ooh, crazy. Cool. She didn't know she had it. So it's like another big hot area right over here. So this is the heart. And this is somebody that's been fasting. Um, so you can see, I mean, there's still a ton of bowel, gallbladder, I intestines, uh, kidneys in the back, um, despite the fact that they've been fasting. So we take these images, and although it looks like this person is moving, the person's laying still, the camera's moving around, and we then um, create these essentially specced images, which are um, you know, reconstructed where this is the short axis, um, this is the apex of the heart, and this is the base of the heart. It kind of wraps around. This is the true base, and this is stress on top, rest on the bottom. And you can see this person has sort of a mild reduction in the anterior wall that persists on these resting images. You can see it here in these vertical long axis. The anterior wall subtly down, so is the apex. Inferior wall looks okay. The pattern is fixed. And so we gate those images, and a fixed abnormality that thickens and moves like this one seems to is considered attenuation. Um, and so this ends up being actually um, uh, bre what breast attenuation looks like. So anterior defect that thickens and moves um, is very commonly and uh, a common artifact that we see in women. So we could easily say that this person has no evidence of ischemia or infarct, heart size is normal, and um, global and regional function is good. Here's another case. Um, oops, let's go back to that one and make it spin. Um, and we spend a lot of time looking at these spins, um, looking for both quality. Patients need to be able to lay flat. 
They need to be able to lay with their arms above their head for 20 minutes, which, you know, some patients it's not easy. Um, so these images, you can see, again, this is a vasodilator I gave this person. So this isn't, I didn't actually stress them. Um, I didn't do anything to decrease blood flow and tracer uptake to the anterior lateral and inferior lateral wall. What I did was essentially increase it everywhere else in the healthy beds. And so it makes the regions that are fed by, by disease or hardened vessels not look as good. So here's, um, this ends up being uh, a pretty large area of, mo of moderate ischemia in the anterior wall and in the apicolateral wall that almost normalizes at rest. And so this would be a large area of um, mild to moderate ischemia in both probably that, um, it probably is both the LED and the circumflex distribution. Um, here's another one. So this is what an infarct looks like. You can see that it, there's almost no trace. There is tracer because tracer uptake is taken up by um, endothelial cells, but you just don't see it as much. Um, you can see that this is a moderate um, size region, a very severely reduced rate of tracer uptake that involves the apical two thirds of the anterior wall and the whole apex. That is the same at rest and stress, and so this is what a large infarct looks like. And this is the. These are the kinds of studies you guys will probably be ordering a lot of as people with big infarcts. So this is a this is a PET scan. So um, again, the images look just the same, um, except that you notice that there's a lot more of them because we can we cut it small, false or uh, far smaller um, segments. So the thickness of the slice is a lot more, so you see a lot more images. And for those of you that haven't looked at a lot of this, this won't mean a much, a much but um, people that have looked at a reasonable amount, this is a 370 pound man. Um, and these are really nice images in a really big person, accomplished in 20 minutes. Um, and you can see a very severe defect that involves the entire septum, apical anterior septum and apex, that just totally normalizes it. And in addition, the whole inferior wall is very severely down and normalizes at rest. It's a really good example of very severe ischemia that involves the you know, apex, anterior septum, and entire inferior wall. And the other thing that this one does, and you guys will, will see this in reports, you'll hear people talk about it upstairs, but if you look at the cavity size, so see how this is a pretty normal cavity size. And look how much bigger the cavity appears here. This is what we call TID, which is called transient ischemic dilatation. And it's a sign, not, in this case, it's not a huge deal because this person you know has multivessel coronary disease, but TID means that it looks like the cavity is bigger at stress than at rest. Um, and that can, is a sign of multivessel disease. And it's not really that we made the cavity because remember, I just gave them a vasodilator where they're laying on a table. It's that the tracer gets hung up in the, in the in, um, uh, kind of outer areas of the myocardium don't diffuse into the subendocardium, and so it makes look like the cavity is larger. But you'll hear people talk about that upstairs. In terms of the, um, the progression of the images from left to right, mm -hmm. what exactly does it represent? If you're looking from left to right? Apex, base. base. Okay. And it wraps around here all the way up to the base. Okay. And if you're ever sitting up there and there's always little um, things here. So this says lateral wall, anterior wall, um, septum, and inferior wall. And typically there's an arrow that says apex, base. Yeah. <laughs> so there's actually, you know, kind of signage. Um, but this is the kind of stuff. Now, not that again, the quantification isn't necessarily isn't necessary in this guy. This guy's going to the cath lab. This guy's going to an operation. This guy's going to have something done. Um, but these are the examples of the numbers that we can get. Um, and this is not FDA approved. We don't charge for this. This is, but it's been 
it's, it's software that has been created here by Jim Caldwell, who's now an emeritus professor, and one of our engineers, Adam, Dr. Adam Alessio, who works with me. And we, we do this by hand. I mean, I do it by hand, but it's using um, pretty extensive mathematical modeling that they validated and published, where we look at actually blood flow. And again, this is CC's per gram per minute, or per CC's per minute per gram of tissue. And you can see at rest, remember we said one is about normal. So it's pretty good. So the vasodilator should augment flow to two to three fold. And so as you can see here, at the base and the mid LAD, he can. But the apical LAD, in fact, he goes the other way. Um, and you can see how he actually develops steel. He actually gets worse in the blood flow in his inferior wall. And you know you can visually see that there. But that actually, so these are the kinds of numbers. And then we calculate a CFR, which is an, an average or normal CFR is two. So this is an example of the numbers that you'll see. And this isn't, most attendings are still kind of getting used to it. Doug Stewart orders a lot of these. He loves these numbers. Um, but most of the other attendings um, are still kind of getting used to what this all means. And we talk a lot about it as a group. What does CFR mean again? Coronary flow, flow reserve. reserve. So the reserve. ability okay. of that coronary artery to dilate. Um, so you can see here, the circumflex has relatively normal resting flow. Anything about two, two and a half is normal um, for stress. And the CFR, which is a ratio of this, is normal. And we visually say, yeah, that circumflex probably looks good. Um, but these two, the LED and the right, are bad. And in the report, we give all the references, all the normal references, so you can see this. So very useful test in people with diffuse coronary disease or transplant patients. And that's our two majors. So Dan and Kevin and Wayne, all those, the heart transplant April, all order these frequently in their post-heart transplant patients because they get small vessel disease that you're going to miss. This is an example. So this is a rest dress pet. It looks pretty good. I mean, there's no dramatic, you know, maybe the base of this person's inferior wall is a little bit down, but it's fixed. This is probably a little down, but it's fixed. This all looks pretty good. So we read this out, big heart, bad EF, which I won't show you, but no evidence of ischemia. And probably no large infarct, maybe this is some sort of something at the very base of the inferior wall. But this is somebody with known multivessel disease, the patient of Doug Stewart's. So what you can see here is his resting flows are all pretty low, but his stress flows, he doesn't really change at all. And so this is one where we worry, even though visually it looks fine, he might have balanced three vessel disease. And sure enough, he went on to a cath and he did have balanced three vessel disease. So this is where PET, PET can be useful. It can be useful in people that have diffuse disease in a lot of places. It can be useful in really big people. And it can be useful in people with transplant, um, and potentially transplant coronary disease. Is it also disease. better if people with arrhythmias, like atrial fibrillation, or do you get better, like, rather than some of the other stress modalities? Um, any vasodilators are probably better at stressing people or at, at creating heterogeneity flow safely than giving anybody dopamine. So yeah, yeah, but that but they could still be imaged with SPECT and, and or PET. Oh, yeah. So quick, um, so that's kind of that's the thing on um, rest stress. Um, yeah. So do do the interventionalists ever use that CFR data to determine if the is significant enough to stand. Do they use those numbers or do they still use FFR and ultrasound? And they will, they do a combination of, of all of it. Mm -hmm. So here we have FFR, but we also have IMR, which is looking for sort of small vessel disease. So yeah, our, our inner, it, it depends. Doug Stewart is a big proponent of, of PET. He mm -hmm. loves PET. And he will take someone to the cath lab and I can't say, I, I, my guess is he has stented people without doing an FFR if we say that the CFR mm -hmm. is abnormal. Um, the Creighton Dawn 
is another one that kind of uses it. Um, some of the other people don't use it as much. But Doug is a huge, he really likes this. He really likes it, yes. Is there any reason why, since it's been validated a bit and stuff, that you guys don't pursue FDA? Well, there is. There are two FDA-approved programs, um, and so I think Jim retired, and Adam is young, and he. I think it's just a lot of work to get things FDA-approved, um, but and I don't think anybody really thinks that we're going to get any more money for it. It's it's hard. <laughs> I'll tell you. That. I mean, you know, this takes me probably, um, you know, it takes a 20 minutes to do the test. It takes us five minutes to read the images and dictate the report. It takes me an hour to do the quantification and then to try to make sense of it. So it's a lot of work, but it's Doug really likes it. Our transplant people really like it. Um, so we so we do it. So I don't think Adam is very exciting. It. It, it's really cool, and we're now doing it in our in pediatric patients here because we're looking at congenital heart disease and you know people with these anomalous coronary arteries and it is better than SPECT and particularly in kids it's so much less radiation um, you know with the with that whole just in time you know uh, this foundation called Just in Time where they take ultrasounds into schools and and um, do screening echoes on kids that want to be, you know, in high-level athletics here in Seattle. They're finding all sorts of people with congenital coronary arteries that, because you can see coronary arteries on an echo in a kid um, because the resolution is pretty good because they're small. And so I do, we do a reasonable amount of them because then what do you do? You have a, you have a 14 year old who's completely asymptomatic, who wants to play basketball in junior high or high school, and we know they have, we know they have a coronary anomaly. So Children's doesn't do enough stress perfusion imaging that they feel comfortable reading them out, so they send them here. And, and we treadmill them or we do pet on them because that's the best study. Okay, so what, we better stop. Friday, we'll go on to viability studies. You'll see, you're here, because I'll talk more about viability and inflammation imaging. So you guys will be doing, a, you'll be ordering a lot of viability scans. They're very easy. We do thallium primarily. We can do PET, but it's super hard. <laughs> I try to dissuade people from doing that. And then the other thing that we do with PET is we do inflammation imaging looking for sarcoid. And I'll talk about that a little bit on Friday. Um, so we have a re we have a large population of sarcoid patients here, um, patients either that are referred here as part of a heart transplant evaluation who have carried a history of or a diagnosis of sarcoid but it's never been confirmed, or people who are followed in Dr. Ragu. We have uh, a pulmonologist here is kind of a world expert in sarcoid, and people come from all over to see him, and they have pulmonary sarcoid, and some of them have who he worries either have abnormal ECGs or having symptoms that might be associated with you know, palpitations or he sends them for PET imaging looking for cardiac um, sarcoid. We, we kind of all have a day you guys on that on Friday, but we do a lot of that imaging, which is really fun. Do you give Lexia and to people with sarcoidosis? Um, no. We, because it's, they can have a flare, right? Well, I have given some, no, but you, these, we've given I've given it as part of a stress test. I've never, I didn't know it could cause flare. Can it? Mm -hmm. Oh, really? So we actually, Pete Sutcliffe and I actually, you know, looked it up and got some, I forget what the name of the medication was, and had the bag hanging just in case. Really? Yeah. Well, oh, Catherine, that's good to know. <laughs> I didn't know that. I'll text Pete today and ask, ask him yeah. what, what the stuff was. It was really, really expensive. So what this is, so what PET imaging is for sarcoid, it doesn't involve any vasodilators. It, it's two tracers. It's rubidium, which is that flow tracer. Oh, right. And FDG, which is a glucose radioactive tracer that goes to inflammatory cells. So we don't do any drugs for them. We just take, we inject two radio tracers and take two set of pictures looking for inflammation. Okay, right, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And people come, you guys, Elena Manami would send people here all the time for pets.
for so the Everett Clinic would send people here for these scans because the inflammation scans because they don't do them really anywhere else and they're really really slick because there's nothing it, it, diagnosing cardiac sarcoid is super hard which reminds me that she's coming back <laughs> <laughs> When I was interviewing you, Catherine, I think you mentioned her, and I thought, I kind of knew that it was close, that she was thinking about it at that point. I don't know if you did, but I was like, oh, I can't say anything, but she's coming too, so <laughs> you need to come too. Oh, I knew that. So oh, I you did? Know. Okay. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when you guys will work with her too. Okay. I know. That's okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. We like Alina Minami. <laughs> <laughs> and all the other attendings. <laughs> um, okay, so other questions you could just we'll, we'll talk about thallium and these inflammation imaging um, on Friday because the fellows don't know don't know much about that either. So. Okay, did did I cover things that you guys knew? There are new these are new things. Okay, bring something to read on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> it won't always. It won't be the same. But I'm. I'm adding. No, that was great, Lori. Thank, thank you so great. much. Oh. Did you ever give um, give a cup of coffee instead of him and off one? Yes, we used to do that oh. when I first started down here in the late '90s. Then the hospital like told us we couldn't give patients coffee. Oh. They. I mean, it was money. I think. Yeah. They were like, we can't serve people coffee. <laughs> we use <laughs> Coke in the clinic. Yeah. We use coffee or Coke. Really? Any pop, really. Yeah. Well, it's the caffeine. Caffeine. Yeah. yeah. And the probably the effervescence of that would make the bowel move away, too. <laughs> I don't know. It's but it requires someone to actually make the pot of coffee and like, keep it going. <laughs> so I know. But I would do that. But they were like, I can't serve patients coffee. And I'm like, but it's an antidote. To so the yeah. slick part about Lexus skin is, as you guys know, it's a 12 hour, in contrast to the diprinamol or the adenosine, which is 24 hours and you abstain from caffeine or, uh, or any xanthine containing product. Um, Ragadenosine is really 12. They've done studies to look at eight, and that's not sufficient. So it really is 12. That's great. But always feel free to call, and always feel free to come down. Card B orders a lot of these tests. Um, and always feel free until, you know, you've kind of, until you can kind of picture in your mind once you've read the report. Um, it, it, it really does make a lot more sense if you just look at a lot of these images. One more question for new onset heart failure. Um, patients who are able to tolerate, do they typically send them to cath or do they um, do stress imaging first for new onset heart failure? Determine if it's ischemic or not ischemic. It's you know? pretty, it's, it is variable. Yeah. This is the thing though. So it's new onset heart failure. Most of the people that get sent here have already don't have no yeah so they don't they either have had, so they may have been kept a long time so they may have been kept a long time ago what you're more likely to see is somebody with a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy comes in with worsening heart failure let's say they've had a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy for 10 years and been followed here intermittently and in the community and they come in for a worsening exacerbation and they have diabetes and they're obese and all of a sudden somebody says, you know, look, nobody's looked at their corners since they were diagnosed 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now that's where, Beth, you'll see a diversion of opinions. There are some attendings that say, oh, their corners were okay 10 years ago, let's just do a rest stress pet. Mm -hmm. Some will say, you know, I think it probably makes sense to cap them every decade. So that's where people will diverge. Um, but I would say the vast majority would go the non-invasive route if they've had a, if they've had known clean coronaries, but it was in the past because we definitely have people who have had long-standing non-ischemic cardiomyopathies who develop coronary disease. I mean, developing coronary disease is a yeah. common thing. So, um, so that's where they may do and. Spec in anybody with a cardiomyopathy, spec tends to be sort of lumpy, bumpy, kind of not as great images. Even in really thin people, they still sort of get this patchy uptake, and people have sort of 
pontificated as to what why that is. I think what makes the most sense to me and the people I kind of believe, it seems that you, know, you can imagine cardiomyopathies have sort of patchy fibrosis. And so, you know, their myocardium is part scar, part um, normal myocytes. And so that, I think that makes the most sense as to what accounts for that. Um, but regardless, they have patchy epic. And so PET is a higher quality scan. So many people will go to a PET. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you Thank so you much, so much Lori. You are welcome. It was amazing.